Great to see everybody. Welcome. Happy New Year. Good to be back. Good to be with you. And we have kind of a hot topic to talk about today here. I would like to discuss, um, and you've had, I've had so many people contact me and ask me to talk about it, the um, unfortunate happenings with John of God, the Brazilian healer. And um, I know that um, a couple of people who are students of mine have, uh, are hoping to join today, uh, who, like me, have been to the Casa, that's John of God's place, And uh, so, uh, let me just start off by telling you my own experiences. Uh, I went there many years ago, I'm thinking perhaps 10 or 15. And at the time I felt motivated because when I would tune in to John of God, he did not feel very healthy. And I thought I should go before he retired. Uh, I intentionally went with a no uh, prior understanding or information on him. I didn't go with a guide. I have traveled the world um, working with healers, sages, and shamans worldwide. I didn't feel I needed one, certainly not in Brazil. Um, you know, it's quite, um, quite cultured. Uh, I uh, intentionally didn't read anything. I, I perform, really prefer to form my own opinion, and I always encourage you to do the same. Don't buy into what somebody else thinks about something. Find out for yourself what you think. And then take the part that you believe in or that resonates for you and just discard the rest. Uh, you can do that with um, a religion, a philosophy, a, a belief system. Uh, you know, I encourage that you always have your mind very active and your uh, skepticism well uh, intact and active all the time, asking yourself, why, why am I believing this? How come, just because my mother does or my grandfather does or mm, my friends do at school, that's no reason why I should believe it. How does it feel to me? Uh, what is my sense of that? So um, so with zero information, except the most scant that I knew there was someone in Brazil that did some kind of energy healing, I went there. And uh, um, it's, a, it's a journey. And we had some, I remember we, we, uh, we had to turn around and uh, we flew across the U.S. Uh, to Florida and then left on the next leg and had to turn around and camp at the airport all night. We had plane problems. So it turned into be like a couple day trip. Because then, then you arrive in um, the capital of Brazil, and then you take another plane, and then you get on a bus, and then you get on a donkey, kind of, all right. And you arrive in this little tiny village where the streets are dirt, but they had phenomenal internet. And the food was good. And so I was set. Um, I, uh, the next morning, my husband and I, Eric, we walked over to the Casa, where he hangs out Wednesdays through Sundays, as I recall. And it was full of people, all dressed in white. That was one of the requirements that you come dressed in white. Um, chock full, maybe a couple hundred people. Standing, sitting, um, in wheelchairs, uh, you know, healthy, not so healthy, just lots and lots of people. And there was nowhere to sit. We were perhaps a half hour ahead of start time, but there was still nowhere to sit. And so I saw a, a platform no one was sitting on, and I'm always... Uh, not afraid to take risks. So I said, let's go sit over there. So we sat there. No one said anything to us. And they were, as I recall, they were saying the rosary. That's a Catholic tradition, right? They were saying the rosary beads. And then all of a sudden, I heard sound and figures moving behind me. And I turned around and looked. And John of God walked up right behind me because I had <laughs> sat on the stage by mistake. But no one said anything to me. So I continued to sit there. So he's right behind me. And he's clearly in a very altered state. Um, strike one against him, because if there's one thing I've been taught and I teach my students is never not be present. Because when you are not present, you are not safe. When you are not present, you can't take care of yourself. You, um, 
you, you know, you have no idea if you are um, uh, protected from people that you meet, uh, spirits that, you know, uh, are attached to them. I mean, you just don't have any idea. So that's the first thing I noticed. It's a very old technique. It's in the teachings that I've had, and I've been studying this work for, you know, nearly 50 years now. Uh, I never saw anybody do that. That went out back in the 30s from, from my study of the history of, of this work because it's not safe. So I was a little bit disturbed by that. I thought that was high risk. Then he, um, he, he's, he's nowhere near his body. He's not there. You could tell his consciousness is somewhere else. And, um, and, and so he's, he, he's like a, um, um, it's kind of spooky to watch. So um, a woman is brought to him from behind the scenes. She's Caucasian. She's American. She's 40-ish. And he pushes her with the help of an attendant up against uh, a white wall. And he took, he turns to what looks like kind of like a nurse or an attendant who's got a tray of medical instruments uh, in her hands. And he, he, looking the other direction, he reaches in and he takes an instrument out and he poked it in her eye. Well, I was beyond startled. <laughs> it was like a knife, okay? It was a scalpel. <laughs> he poked it right in her eye. And I'm like, oh my God. Remember, I hadn't prepped for this at all. <laughs> uh, I was like, wow. And she falls back into a wheelchair and they wheel her away. That's the start. That was step one. Uh, he did a few of these, and then they lead him off back to the green room. That was day one. So we went back to the, um, you couldn't call it a hotel. It was like a little youth hostel. We went back to the youth hall hostel and kicked around what we had just witnessed. Again, I'm refusing to read anything. I want to just use my own discernment. So far, my discernment is he's not safe, but he's got quite a skill of some kind. Now, remember, skills can come from the dark or they can come from the light. And so I'm feeling into this. The place itself felt dark, but that could be from a lot of dark work that had been done there that had not been properly cleared. He himself felt, um, the word is maybe not confused, but conflicted. He felt conflicted. So I thought, well, we'll go to day two. So day two, you go over there and you stand in line and the line takes about an hour. Or at least we arrived, it took us an hour. And halfway up the line, someone stops you and says, what language would you like to be interpreted in? Because of course, John of God only speaks Portuguese, it being Brazil. I said English, my husband, Eric said French. So Eric's interpreter, they were right behind me. I come up, finally I come up next. The interpreter says, to you in English, um, how can John of God help you or something of, of that nature? And I said, um, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I think I mentioned some physical problem as I recall, you know, I mentioned a knee or something. And he turns and says something to John of God and John of God spoke to him and they had this little conversation back and forth. And then the interpreter said to me, you're gonna be taken into another room. I was like, oh. So I was led to another room where I sat uh, for a while. And then another uh, person came in, another woman came in and she said, you have been asked by John of God, if you'd be willing to work here for a while, how long are you in town? And I said, oh, we'll be here three weeks. And she said, would you be willing to, uh, to help him? And I said, oh, of course. So um, he had obviously discerned something. So I would say his, his, uh, his uh, radar was pretty strong. And um, and then we were taken, uh, then I was brought back into the regular mix of people and, and reconnected with Eric. Um, and we were taken to another room where we were to receive the healing. Now, if you're under 40, which we were not at the time, uh, 40, have some kind of an age break there. They don't want to have you go through the experience of being cut or, or poked out with a scalpel. Uh, you know, the risks are too high. Uh, you know, you might, you know, might have a stroke or a heart attack out of fear or something. So that's only for people under, say, 40. 
And so those of us who were over 40 were put in a room and um, uh, he came in and um, perhaps gave a blessing to the room. I did not sense anything. And I made another note. So I'm sitting there through these couple, three days and I'm making notes to myself. Uh, I came back, then, then I was given a card, a special card so I could work there. And I came back and as I said, we stayed a number of weeks and um, it was very interesting. Uh, it was very spooky though. It was difficult for me because A, it wasn't correct technique. It was all very from like the dark ages, all right? It, uh, it had a lot of earmarkings of voodoo. Uh, the longer I stayed there, the more anxious I became and uncomfortable. But I've been in other situations around the world where I've studied with other, uh, other shamans and practitioners, and I don't always admire their work. I don't always agree with uh, what they're doing, but I still learn a lot, and it really tunes up your discernment skills. Um, it was very, very dark. And um, that's probably the most I can say about it. So I, I was just as disheartened as you all were upon reading the, was it a Washington Post article right about a month ago, very disheartening news about him. Um, I'm not sure that that's what was going on when I was there 10 or 15 years ago. I have very, very strong antenna on sexual abuse Having been a survivor of it myself, I never miss it. It's like you're wearing a spotlight on your forehead, whether you're the perpetrator or the victim, I never miss it. I am I'm reasonably certain that's not something I would have accused him of then. Uh, but I'm not too comfortable with what I've read about the state he's in now. Now, with that said, let's talk about uh, all the all the other people uh, I I'm, I'd like to call on a few people to talk about because he's one of what hundreds of spiritual leaders who have gone to uh, have, have perhaps gone from the light to the dark on the subject of sex. Sometimes it's money. I'm sure, you can name a guru or two, right? Who cheated and stole and um, and sometimes it's. Uh, and, and many times it's, it's sex, many, many, many times. And I'll tell you why. Um, when you're elevated to a position of, of um, teacher, you get the idea that, and it's a product of adulation. So here's what happens. Pretty soon the person who's, who's been given this elevated status by followers starts to think that somehow they are exempt from regular rules. Uh, they, they actually tell themselves this, that, that those rules don't apply to me. Uh, my followers need me. I need this uh, practice to uh, stay healthy. I need this uh, relief, this uh, assurance from women and, and fill in the blank any old way you want. But they convince themselves that from the adulation, that it twist, it's like it, it's a twist inside of them. I can feel it. And I have looked at many um, spiritual leaders in the U.S. that are my contemporaries, and I have seen it. I can see it. It's like a real twist inside their, inside their brain. And one of the first I saw, I was in a green room, and this was maybe 20 years ago, and I, I was, uh, they, a woman walked in who was very much my senior in the spiritual leading field, um, younger than me, but very much my senior. She'd been out doing it for 20 or 30 years. And I could sense how the adulation was actually killing her. And she then died not too long ago. I'm going to say uh, five, five, eight, seven years ago died early in her 50s because the, the, the intense obsession and need that she developed for that adulation ended up destroying her physically. She may have checked out early because it was the only way to escape this very unhealthy and, and unspiritual obsession. 
So just think of yourself and all the addictions that you've dealt with in your life. I'm sure, like me, I'm a terribly addictive personality, but I bet you are too. I bet you've gotten yourself hooked on something, sugar, caffeine, uh, just let me you know, keep naming the names, right? There isn't a one of us. Well, what if it was, what if it was uh, you were a, an important spiritual leader and some uh, you know, beautiful blonde, fill in the blank any way you like, and then once you've tasted that, then you can't stop. And that one time you were just tired, you were lonely, you were weak, you were traveling, and now it's an obsession. It's an obsession. I bet you anything that's what happened here. Uh, the man, John of God, was harassed by the Catholic Church in Brazil. From the time he developed this, quote, gift, when he was 17 or 18. Now, now after I left the country, I sat down and read everything about him. Then I could read what others said, because I'd already formed my opinion. And he was harassed uh, by them. And then they finally gave up and kind of, uh, kind of came to a truce. Here, I'm going to say five or 10 years ago, maybe, where they quit bugging him. And they just kind of let him hang out out there at the Casa. One other thing that really bothered me at the Casa that I could really sense was they were hitting me up real hard for money. And it's supposed to be a charity, you know? And from the day we got there to the day they left, there were many, many ways that they hit you up to invest, to subscribe, to help out, to buy a crystal to lay on the crystal bed, to do this, to do that. And we ended up spending more there than if we'd gone to a nice five-star hotel somewhere, honestly. Uh, and they made you feel so guilty if you weren't constantly whipping your wallet out. So, you know, that also really, really bothered me, was that he claimed he was a lawyer who was, and a farmer who was well-fixed and had his other businesses running Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then came to the CASA and did this spiritual work, as I recall, Thursday through Sunday. Maybe it was Friday through Sunday. But boy, uh, he was sure raking it in <laughs> at the CASA. So I want you to learn from this experience. Don't be disheartened any, more, any longer than I was, which was a day or two. And I came to the realization that he bit the dust just like so many others. It's hard. It's going to be really hard for him to deny this. There are now 12, I think, 12 women. I believe who've come out against him, but I'd also like to talk about some of the others, uh, some of the others. So the point of me talking about this today is I really want you to, to um, go home knowing that this can happen to anyone, but you are much more likely to be stricken down. The higher you get, the farther you can fall. Uh, say that to yourself about yourself. The higher you can get, the farther the opportunity is for you to fall. I am so conscious of this all the time because, um, you know, you, you, uh, people start listening to you and looking up to you and following you. Uh, who knows what temptations that can bring because it, 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 it inflates the ego. It just does. All right, Suzanne. Um, love to hear your comments here. Well, my experience was with a yoga teacher. I don't know if uh -huh. anybody's familiar with John Friend. He developed a beautiful practice called Anyasara Yoga, which was heart opening. So you can imagine all these postures got all these people just so loving and heart ready. And he had a big fall and now he's pretty much gone off the scene although his practice was amazing. But because he was having inappropriate affairs with uh, his students, and he was an older gentleman as well, it's now completely gone. And it's a shame, it's such a shame, because the practice was really valid. But he lost all his followers, and I don't even know if anybody can even find anything about him anymore. Maybe if you Google it, you might. And his name was John Friend. It's, it's such a shame. So I can see how that can happen. Did he come after you, Suzanne? No, no, not at all. I'm you a little old. <laughs> this was about felt, 10 years ago. I was still old. You, you just felt contaminated by, from being in the setting? No, no not at all. Oh, yeah, I you know, it, I, I didn't come from that space, but people around me, younger women did, and they shared that with me. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. I understood it through them. I, I, 
it didn't it didn't touch me at all. Well, just to co just to give you a comment back, uh, the last time this happened to me, I thought I was frankly past the point of it ever happening to me again. And uh, re your reference to age, and this gentleman was a good ten or fifteen years younger than me, maybe twenty. I have no clue. It didn't matter. And it wasn't a sex thing; it was a power thing. It was a power thing. He thought, "Oh, she's in a position of vulnerability. She needs me." Um, and I was beyond uh, disgusted. And I regret, it was long before Me Too. If it had been a Me Too moment, I would have come right out publicly. I'm still, still contemplating doing that. Uh, because the whole Me, Me Too thing, just uh, maybe for many of you, it really heated up all those moments that I had been improperly accosted, touched, uh, spoken to, you know, I mean, you guys know, there are a lot of those moments when you look back over your life. I, I was really uh, uh, re-triggered. I'm sure you were too. So yeah, Suzanne, thanks for your comments. Jan Stein, looks like there's people here who want to talk about this. How about you, Jan? I'll unmute you. Good. Hey, it's good to see everyone. Yeah, you too. Um, yeah, I don't have any experience with John of God, but certainly as when I heard the story, it it brought to mind again all of the things that happen in all different areas of business and politics or what have you. Whenever there's a position, a person in position of power and kind of um, loses their humanness, you know, there's nothing to that. There, there seems to be a, a lack of um, balance or something that reminds them of their humanness and allows them to cope beyond those bounds it's kind of I well those bounds don't apply to them you see that's yeah. what they say to themselves and then you know the classic thing you hear is that it's part of the spiritual treatment <sighs> you know you've heard that right i went to a um a center in nevada city california 20 30 years ago and spent a week there we were going to stay a month and do a long meditation over the christmas holiday and i had to leave because i could sense the horrible sexual abuse that was going on. And it's, I don't know how many of you've heard about it. Donald Walters is his, um, his um, regular name, um, uh, Swami Kiryanda. You, you guys have not heard of him. Big Yogananda campus, big Yogananda uh, deal. And we all admire Yogananda, right? Mm -hmm. It's a spinoff of the, What's the one in L.A. called? Uh, Self-Realization Fellowship? Self, it's, it's, it's a spinoff of theirs. It's supposed to be equal and just as good. And I was so horrified. So just about three weeks ago, I went to a dinner, and this man walks up to me and introduces me at himself as a big player there at, at um, uh, Kriyananda's um, place in Nevada City. And I, I and a whole lot of people around listening, and I said, how could you do that? How could you stay there when all those women who were your friends weren't safe and you're still there? I said, that is just incomprehensible. He, he didn't answer me. He just got embarrassed and turned and walked off. He never mm -hmm. answered. I was so shocked. Wasn't there also another... Um, you know, he was never arrested or anything. It's just disgusting. Wasn't there a guy up in Oregon or a group up in Oregon? This was a while, quite a while ago. I think there's a Netflix documentary on Osho. Yeah, Osho. Another one. Yeah. Yeah. At when people are at their most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing. Sure. Yeah, good to hear from you. Good to see you. Hey, Vedran. I think you're... Uh, there you are. Hi. Hi. Hey. Hmm. Definitely deep topic and uh, it's coming up uh, more and more. And um, I really uh, didn't have personal experience with uh, this kind of stuff, but uh, somehow still I can perceive it somewhere out there and how we we can use sexual energy to manipulate and to, to control. fight for power. It's called control. control. It come, everything comes from there. You know, first story in the, the Bible, 
tell us that there there is sexual play uh, and all the the guilt and and shame and everything that is going with it uh, that we are carrying somehow in our field. So uh, so this kind of stuff triggers uh, and bro- breaks my heart somehow at some point when I heard what's going on because. For me, uh, from distance, uh, he's, he, John, was uh, someone that, how they call faith healer, that makes miracles and performs the things that we cannot explain with our, our conscious mind. And, uh, and uh, e- either if he is guilty or if he is set on both sides of the, you know, in both, ca- both cases, for me, it's, uh, uh, it's heartbreaking. Oh, I don't know what, it, what mm-hmm. exactly happen because I wasn't there and I don't have direct experience but if humanity is able to to put this kind of stories on someone that it's that it's doing like higher consciousness stuff or if the person who have this big gift uh, from spirit uh, can be so uh, well let's talk about that for a minute because let's not assume that what appear to be gifts are gifts of light I mentioned this just briefly in my opening remarks. Do not assume that because someone can do something paranormal that they're doing it from the light. Remember, the dark is just as powerful. Use your own body. Linda Richards is sitting here. She'd be perfect for this because she's really attuned now with her own body. Just use your own body and feel into it. Does that feel light to you? And there they are levitating or raising a spoon off the table or projecting an object across the room, or what's his name in India that could manifest ash out of thin air? You know, half the Indian continent reveres the guru I'm currently speaking of. He's the biggest name in India. I'm trying to think of what his name is. And I never went there when I was in India because my sense was, no, don't go there. It's very southern India. I mean, literally half the continent reveres him as the, like the manifestation of God. And it's been known for 20 years that he abuses little boys. That's just like his hobby. Poonam said Sai Baba. It is Sai Baba. Thank you. Okay. He's still, uh, he's still living. He's still revered. He's still revered. I don't know why they haven't arrested him. Mm -hmm. And I've lost all, uh, ability to, to, to even be um, tactful about this topic. It's everywhere. And it's, it's just as rife in our politics, as we've noticed, as it is in our uh, spiritual leaders. It's, it's power. Power, um, power corrupts. Power corrupts, absolutely. Who said that, Shakespeare? It's really true. It's really true. And you only have to get a little bit and you'll feel it. If you're conscious, you'll feel it in yourself and you immediately should be recoiling and thinking, Oh God, I don't want to go there. I don't want that to happen to me. So I did see John of God. Um, I can't say I ever saw anything paranormal except him, you know, stabbing people with scalpels and they didn't bleed, but that is not necessarily light. You can do that with hypnosis. I could name some teachers right here in the U.S. right this moment uh, who are very admired, who are using hypnosis techniques on their audiences. You can hypnotize a whole audience if you're powerful enough and, and lead them to believe that, you know, the sky's purple and rabbits are popping out of walls. And so that hypnotic power, uh, I, I did not feel I saw anything when I was at John of God's that was a spiritual power a light power. I thought I saw a lot of things that were more, I've seen a lot of voodoo. I've traveled to a lot of places where voodoo is pretty prominently used, including by the way, Louisiana. You don't have to leave, leave the uh, U.S. To, to get a flavor of it. It's very dark. It's very dark. And that's, that's a lot of what I picked up. Uh, nevertheless, I hung around for a while and worked there. Now I worked for a literally for a healer in the U.S. for almost 10 years. My husband was horrified every time I would work there a week out of the month, and he would say, Deborah, Deborah, don't go back down there. One of these days, you're going to get banged up. <laughs> and then I finally did. But um, 
I learned so much. It's actually the way I learned to affect uh, power from distance from the back of the room. You've heard me talk about this teacher who wouldn't let me move out behind the sound table because she was so worried that I might be more powerful than she was. And so she had me stuck back there. And um, uh, that's actually where I learned it. So uh, and she was extremely dark and got darker every year. I mean, I literally watched her just tank. Just, you know, she was precariously balanced between the light and the dark the day I met her. And then she just went, eh. and she used to talk about a healer and a teacher that she had followed who was, who was um, incredibly clairvoyant. She studied with him. She told me, I think three years, incredibly clairvoyant, not necessarily a gift of the light, by the way, be really careful when people are very clairvoyant. You know, I never push it because I see it's more often uh, an exercise of the dark than the light. Honestly, I do. Um, and, and then he developed the gift of healing and it went to his head. He actually healed a couple people of who knows what, something. And she mentioned, this was when she was still slightly more light than dark, that it affected him so drastically. He became such an autocrat and, and who knows, maybe, maybe an abuser, who knows, that he lost all his gifts. Just a couple years later, he couldn't, he, he, he lost all of his clairvoyance. He lost everything and died, you know, bitter and broken. So this is a real interesting topic for us. It is. Hey, thanks very much, Vadran, for participating. And I'll go to, I think Nancy's next. Nancy, have you got your... I, I think my sound is working. Yes. Excellent. Good okay, to hear I, from Yeah, I, I fixed it. Um, yeah, well, the person I'd like to talk about, I did not have personal experience with this man, but I was very close to a friend who did. I, 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 maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago. This is the man who was originally the founder of the yoga center, the big yoga center in Western Massachusetts, Kripalu, that many of you have heard of. Deborah has taught there. And he was big deal yoga follower. Everybody worshipped and thought he was wonderful. I know who you're talking about. And his name was Amrit, A-M-R-I-T, Desai, D-E-S-A-I. And he had a huge fall from grace because same reason as John of God, it turned out that he was abusing a lot of the female students. Right. And the two things that I want to mention about it, um, I was studying dream work intensively back then, going to a lot of dream classes, you know, sharing dreams with other people and that kind of thing. And my dream teacher, the first time he went to Kripalu to teach, they put him in, in the teacher's residence, which is a separate building from the, from the big central brick building. And he said, I was having these crazy dreams all night of all these orgies. And they were like, because it, it, it's in the air, it's in the atmosphere, because yes. that's what was happening. And it had just come out that this actually happened, you know, like, maybe like, you know, a year or two ago. So when he told that to the people that manage Kripalu, they thought, oh, wow, this guy's the real deal. He really, he can really pick up on the energy. But it's, you can feel it. I mean, it's like if somebody, when Deborah was talking about John of God and some of the other, you know, misbehaving men, I just started getting shivers and creepy feelings like, oh, you know, it's like just, you, you can and, feel it if you're sensitive. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. And it's not always men. Just to, mm -hmm. uh, let me tell you that, that this female teacher I had that went south right, came, right. came after a very attractive male student who was about, 10 or 15 years her junior. I mean, to the point where we were all so embarrassed for her. Oh. We were like, oh, please stop. We can see what you're doing. I mean, it was gross. Oh, yes. So, well, yeah, it's not always, yeah. It can just, there's one other thing I'd like to say, if I have another couple of minutes. Yeah, go ahead. My friend was very addictive personality, overweight, cigarette smoke. She used to drink a lot, and she did massage. And that's what I saw her for. She gave me a massage fairly regularly. But I was more of a counselor and coach to her than, than I benefited from the body work, actually. But I mean, I just, you know, she was a friend. And I could tell that she was so, she was a big follower of his. And when he came, she had some sexual abuse in her background, too, as a child. So, you know, when she, that came out about him, he never went after her. But she, I think she was actually a little hurt that he never did, <laughs> you know, which is kind of twisted. That's very but twisted. She was so disheartened and 
demoralized and she just it's almost like she just didn't she never went back to Kripalu she lost faith in the whole institution oh. and she she really it's like she was something in her broke and she never really got her spirit back yeah. so she was a very like she follows people you know she didn't have a real strong center of her own she wanted somebody to to lead her and it, it really hurt her. So I'm, I'm thinking about all these women that got abused and they, you know, they believed in this person. They, they looked up to him. They wanted to learn. They wanted well, to. Well, it's about and three, three quarters of the world. Much damage was done. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, you know, but talk about Kripalu for a moment, Nancy. Thank you so much. Um, uh, but I, well, the first day I stepped on the campus as mm -hmm. a teacher, I was like, oh my God, this place is very dark. And I asked to be moved. I mm -hmm. went in and I said, where are you housing me? And he said, oh, here in the main building. I said, no, no, I can't stay here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so then I called management after I left. I went back to the sales gal and, gal, and then I said, can I talk to management? I think they should know about this. And I mentioned it to them and you know, they would not reveal it. Yes. They that, hit it. I said, I'm sensing some very bad juju here in the way of sexual abuse. Oh no, that can't be our our campus. And I said, well, they hid it from. They wouldn't acknowledge it. And then yeah. you know, later it became public information. Mm -hmm. See how yeah, they all try I, to hide it. They always do. I actually worked with another teacher there. I really liked. And uh, she moved to California, unfortunately. So you know, she's not on the East Coast anymore. So I don't see her. But she really wanted to do a presentation about sexual abuse, and they wouldn't let her do it. Because every <laughs> workshop that she had, it kept coming up, it kept coming up. Because as Deborah, as you know, it's so common. Yeah. And she really wanted to do, she kept presenting, like, I want to do this topic. You know, please, you know, she, the people that took her course, she said, please, on the evaluation, fill out that you want me to do this. They wouldn't let her do it. And she finally... I almost felt like, and I think I taught there two or three times and then just finally had to throw in the towel because it's too dark a campus for me. Mm -hmm. I, I almost felt like they needed to uh, burn the buildings down. I know they're brick, mm -hmm. so you know, dismantle them, not burn them, but dismantle them. Have a shaman come like an you know, American Indian shaman and cleanse the ground and then rebuild. It's a beautiful setting, but it is yeah. very toxic there. It mm -hmm. is, it is. Well, great, Th Nancy, thanks for contributing. Sure. And I'll go to Linda, who I bet has something to say about this. Hi, Linda. Hi. Oh, um, I don't know much about John of God, but uh -huh. um, I do. Um, he gives me the willies ever since I've heard uh -huh. about what he does. That just gives me the will willies. But I do know that once you start working in, in the energy field and, and start learning about this and the big thing for me to learn was discernment, for sure. Discernment was the biggest thing because there are jealousies amongst us and there are people that want to um, be be seen as better or be seen as, as, as knowing and showing what they know. And to be able to discern that with humility and still love the person is is really hard sometimes. Because you have to sometimes, you know, stop being friends with people. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's hard and you don't know what is legit now until you start getting that feeling. Like I sense it. I can sense when I go into a room. I can sense when people are talking, if they're telling the truth or lying. Sometimes it's not, you know, I, uh -huh. I don't like it so much. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, you're uh, you're very discerning, mm -hmm. and you've just been around the block a lot, you know, and, and you've been and you've stayed aware the whole time. Uh, me too. That's you know, and there, there was a time, you know, like when when I first wanted to have children, there was a time when I wanted to know myself: am am I going to be an abuser? Because I, you know, like I was told when I was in counseling that, you know, that, you know, abuser that doesn't get fixed can also abuse other people. And, you know, that was a, a concern of mine. And I know that that is in, you know, that can be in a person and you can learn not to, uh, to learn about it and to express about it and it puts you out in the open. Because I, I, I never went down that road. Uh-huh. Well, thanks, Linda. Very helpful. Yeah, nice to see you. Nice to see you, too.
Uh huh. And uh, Ruth, if Ruth is there, I don't see her. Are you there, Ruth? Looks like maybe she's uh, lost her connection right now. Um, anybody who wants to kick around this topic of your own uh, experiences or uh, you know, or, or your own thoughts on this subject, um, please just uh, just let me know. Um, I'm uh, still learning this uh, this new system. And um, how about? Uh, I see some more hands in the air. How about uh, Julie Martin? Julie, I don't think you've been up yet, huh? And Ardell. Ardell, let's start with you. Hi, Ardell. Hi, good afternoon. Hi. Um, likewise, I have, don't have a lot of experience with um, energy healers or um, and, uh, very diverse kinds of leaders in that field. What I have uh, certainly experienced over time have been leaders in any field and whether or not they have a system of support and accountability. When I find out that someone pushes aside that accountability um, just on an ongoing basis. Now, I'm not talking about annual reports and all that kind of thing. But if your practices, whatever they are, don't stand up to supportive scrutiny, where there are people in your circle who can confront you or raise issues of concern, then there's a lot to be concerned about. It may never result in say financial mismanagement or organizational mismanagement, but inevitably it seriously affects relationships and the effectiveness of the organization. Mm -hmm. And see, you're alluding to the same thing I was talking about when I was using the term adulation. There, I mean, who's going to supervise John of God? No, nobody. You think his team, his colleagues are going to say to him, you know, John, that, 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 that's, that's a, a, overly, uh, uh, you know, overly intimate way to, to relate to that woman client. Nobody's going to say that to him. Which is the problem. It'll which be interesting. Is, which is the problem. Which is the problem. As, as Ardell says, we need oversight. It'll be interesting in light of Me Too, mm -hmm. whether organizations start to set this in place. Uh-huh. Um, well, I think they are open accountability of no, some I, kind. I think they are. I, at least in Hollywood, it's definitely coming in now where there's quite a bit of a review and oversight and open, much more open door feeling. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I mean, look what's happening to Kevin Spacey right now. I'm sure you're seeing that in the news. Yeah. He, he was just arrested again, right? On another charge, uh -huh. sexual abuse, I think so. Like he's got a couple of... Uh, survivors telling stories now not not just the one young man who had an enormous amount of credibility um that now there's someone else well thank you for sharing ardell and you know with your history as a lifelong uh, counselor you know you you have a, you have a valuable opinion here you've had a lot of time you've had a lifetime to observe that's where we're getting our wisdom from gang is if we're really aware and constantly discerning and using your, you always use your skeptical muscle, I'll always say, well, you know, does this seem right to me? Or what am, am I hearing? Well, I don't agree with what I'm hearing. Uh, don't feel like you have to agree with anybody. Use your own, use your own. And, and you know, you'll hit um, 40 or 50 and you'll be just wise as can be. And then you just keep getting wiser. I think, uh, thanks, Ardell. I think we have Ruth here. Is that Ruth? I see Ruth's face, or almost. Uh, Ruth, can I hear you? Maybe you need, Ruth, you need to come back. I think go out and come back. Uh, I'll go to Julie Martin. Hey, Julie. Hi. Um, 
Yeah, the, the experience I wanted to talk about was during one of your workshops and one of the students was reacting in the audience like she typically did during an initiation. And uh, I would always feel the energy and I felt like it was light and started to kind of reach for it and then realized um, it wasn't. And that kind of... Um, Can you help me out a little bit? Can you tell me which workshop it was? Because like, I think um, you already figured it out. Uh, yeah, it, well, it was, it was uh, Christy. Um, which, which workshop? I don't remember. It was a live stream. Oh, um, you were at home watching it? Yeah, I was at home watching it. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so it, it, um, it concerns me because it felt like light to me at first. And then, yeah. and then it turned out, it turned out to be dark. The people there felt it was dark. Yeah. Well, that yeah, can yeah. happen. You, yeah. You know, everybody here will hold up their hand, I'm sure, and say, oh, yeah, that's happened to me, where first I thought it was light, and then I realized it was dark, or first I thought it was dark, and then it became light. Yeah. And that can yeah. definitely happen. Remember, because the transformation can happen so quickly, at least going from dark to light. Now, when it goes from light to dark, usually it's more uh, that there has been um, a, um, a hiding of the actual nature of it. Now, I saw a lot, now I'm just going back to John of God for a minute, I saw quite a bit of that there. Again, I would see these things that look like gifts, and then I would look below the surface and I would realize it was a lot of fanfare and fluff and smoke, but there right. was actually no spiritual light underpinning it. So you, mm -hmm. you, 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 you know, you're momentarily you're being fooled. Right. Oh, early. right. And there's always and, a lot of... Um, I use a trickster. Trickster. Perfect. Perfect. Great yeah. word. Yes. And lots of times there's a lot of um, uh, hypnotism going on. I'm very, very wary. You've heard me counsel against being hypnotized. You can be hypnotized in a crowd, too. Mm -hmm. so, you know, uh, always want to be the lone thinker. You know, don't go with the crowd. Who cares what the crowd thinks? Mm -hmm. They're a bunch of sheep. Now think for yeah. yourself. Always think for yourself. Yeah. yeah. Well, great. Thank you so much, Julie, for contributing. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else got their hand in the air? Um, um, again, uh, this is a newer platform. Let me try this and then see if I can see it here. So, you know, we could talk endlessly about around the world. We could come up with so many different... Uh, um, people we could name, you know, there's guru a minute practically, right? To, uh, falls prey to this problem. If again, if it's not money, it's sex. If it's not sex, it's money. In fact, when I was just looking at um, just before we started, I had a few minutes and I was looking at, um, uh, at uh, the one that was, so, was so, such a scandalous experience for me, Kri Yonanda in Northern California, otherwise known as J. Donald Walters, if that isn't ironic, <laughs> sorry, to take such a fancy name. I see that right now he's, uh, he's facing charges in Italy. Um, he left um, Nevada City because of his problems with um, the sexual abuse thing, but in Italy he's just been, uh, uh, he, he was also accused of, um, of um, stealing. So he went after both things, money and uh, sex. Um, it's, uh, and, 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 you know, it's a cult. Uh, beware, beware cults. That's another thing you can really beware. So we're rolling down here to the end. Is there anybody here that raised your hand? Elizabeth, did you get called on? I don't think you did. Hi there. Hi there. <laughs> what are your, what are your uh, thoughts on this? I, well, there were so many, but one of my questions for you is, in light of the experience that you've had, is there a safe or protected way to learn from someone who's exhibiting both light and darkness? Or is it always best to just throw the baby out with the bathwater and cut a wide berth? That, you know, that's a really good question. Um, if you're teaching and you know that you've been exposed to a lot of dark and you've you've stayed uh, safe you've had other teachers around you who've said oh boy you're strong you're safe you're 
your field is impregnable and then, you know, and you go for it. But if you're still seeing yourself as pretty much learning, I would stay steer clear. Mm -hmm. um, I think we just, I just spoke to Vedran about this just yesterday at another, on another call where he asked me about going to see John of God about a year ago and I counseled him against it. I didn't say much. I just said, ah, oh, you know, I think I'd save my money. Mm -hmm. uh, cause he, he was beginning to feel very dark to me as time went on and I wouldn't ever want a student to be in a really dark situation. Yeah. It's, it's risky. It's definitely risky. And can't we name uh, right offhand a dozen students who've been very, very much hurt by the dark. Yeah. Put your pad and pencil out and make a list. Cause I'm sure you can name them. You've seen them tumble and, mm -hmm. You haven't seen them pull themselves out of the mud yet, right? Not, not no. so much. No, no. So it's, and, they, and you can get so, so sick from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When this all came up last month, one of the things, I live in an area where we have, you know, the Monroe Institute is here, and um, there's an ashram nearby, and they're, they're just very, um, outside of Charlottesville in Virginia. Uh-huh. Um, and there are, there's synchronicity, which is a teacher who I won't be around. Um, but one of the things that I started just as a, as a lay person to look into was what creates trust between people and factions and the things well, that I've currency. Well, yeah, the three things that I've found are authenticity rigor in logic, like being able to explain where you're coming from and having that be comprehensible by both sides and an idea that there's empathy toward the person who you're trying to earn trust from. Mm -hmm. I think those and are I'm, words. Or is, and I'm finding in a lot of these spiritual teachers that fall, it's really interesting to me because they seem to be there seems to be, it's like a balloon, the facade, but those three things that are traditionally accepted as reasons for trust are all seem to be missing from behind these, these people. And I'm wondering how they get to an elevated place of trust. Um, or if they had... Three, it was authenticity. Authenticity. Mm -hmm. Rigor and logic you know, a cohesive argument, a cohesive explanation of what's happening and empathy toward, with, toward you, but, you know, empathy toward the person with whom they're having a, an exchange seem uh -huh. to be the three commonalities that I've found. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, you know, I was invited to go work with John of God myself. And I, um, I was flattered right up one side and down another, and I still said no, which kind of surprised me. How much time me. did you spend at the CASA? I was never at the CASA. I was in, um, I just was in a, in a place where his um, forward folks were coming to look to see if he, he often goes to Omega, and he was looking to go to another place um, in the United States. And... Um, I guess they were trying to build up an English-speaking team who could work around him. Oh, so it was in the, more the venue, venue and marketing aspects of it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And, they, and I met his forward people, and they said, please come down and, to the CASA and get trained and work with him when he's in the States. And as flattered as I was, I wasn't able to say yes. It just wouldn't come out of my mouth. Um, but he didn't seem to have the authenticity, the rigor and logic, or the empathy. I didn't, I've never seen him. I've never been. He has a lot of empathy. Um, does and, he? Uh, yeah, and there's no logic because um, he, I, uh, there may be logic, but it's not discernible because he's not bilingual. And he's okay. not translated as a speaker, so you wouldn't know if he was logical or not. And then, and then even if, even if he were English speaking, I'm not sure I would add logic to your list. I'm not sure I agree with that uh, because it's, it's a pretty difficult to be logical about the paranormal. Yes. Yeah. So I'm not sure I would add that uh, as, as a, 
as a criteria, I, I would suggest adding uh, um, transparency though. Mm -hmm. I would definitely suggest you add that. That was something that was definitely missing from his platform. Mm -hmm. It was not transparent. It was pretty well covered up, you know, what was going on. And, and, and what the difference between transparency and authenticity, you know, those two are kind of married, aren't they? That's, that's pretty hard to separate them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, you know, choose your teachers wisely. Be, care be really careful where you go. Uh, I I've seen some very talented students fall. And it's very sad to lose them. Just a couple last year, for those of you who are in my advanced program. Uh, it's very sad. Um, and and uh, they're literally, they're, they're stricken, uh, you know, with... Uh, uh, they, they're tainted with darkness, and it's pretty hard to erase or undo. Uh, and so, you know, some of the old, um, uh, you know, you, you, you may have had been told, you know, be careful about uh, things as, that, that seem as, uh, as harmless as Ouija boards. Mm -hmm. I would never pick one up. The dark, darkness can actually permeate objects. For sure. Mm -hmm. And of course, protect yourself with your meditation. Mm -hmm. that's, your, that's your biggest protection. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any further questions? Right down to the end of time. Uh, I see a, a couple questions that came in uh, through, the, um, uh, through the chat room. Uh, I think I've covered them all though. So uh, uh, thanks Elizabeth. And um, uh, take a moment and if you haven't um, uh, gotten my blog for this week yet, it's gonna go out here shortly. It's on a completely dissimilar topic, but I wanna make sure everybody catches it. It's, it's about your relationship with the cosmos, with the universe. I think you'll find it interesting. All right, everybody, great seeing you. And until we meet again, you guys all take care. Thanks. Very interesting conversation today. Bye-bye.